It's estimated that in 2021, we lost about one half of our managed honeybee colonies. Can you imagine if we said that about any other livestock? Half our cows died, better luck next year. We're in the boy who cried wolf era of bees. Colony loss stats have been making headlines for so long that save the bees has become a passionless expression. But bees are responsible for pollinating about one third of our crops. And there are officially eight billion people to feed. We should care now more than ever. Beekeepers have reported several causes of colony loss in their operations. Let's take a look at three of them. Varroa mites. Varroa mites are external parasites that damage honeybee brood and transmit a number of deadly viruses. They were accidentally introduced to Florida in the 80s and are now found in just about every honeybee colony in the US. Varroa mite populations grow exponentially. A female mite reproduces multiple times in her life and each of her daughters produce multiple daughters, produce multiple daughters, produce multiple daughters. This reproduction occurs under capped brood cells hidden from the human eye. Since varroa mites are relatively new to the US, our bees haven't yet evolved natural defenses against them. This burdens beekeepers with the responsibility of regularly monitoring varroa mite populations and making tough judgment calls on management. Unfortunately, there currently isn't a one size fits all solution. Next up is queen issues. A queen is the only reproducing female in a colony. She mates once in her lifetime, storing sperm in a sac inside her body for later use. If she fails to keep the sperm viable, she won't be able to lay viable eggs, and the colony's population will plummet. Beekeepers have to pay close attention to their hives and actively replace underperforming queens when the hive's unable to do so. Next is starvation. There are a number of factors at play here, but one of them is monoculture agriculture. When a single crop is planted for acres and acres, once it's done blooming for the season, there's nothing left for the bees to forage. Tackling this will require revamping our current agricultural system. A good first step could be to encourage farmers to more widely practice intercropping, which is growing multiple crops alongside each other. Planting more flower and cover crops and hedgerows could also increase bee forage. But I'm probably not talking to an audience of scientists, beekeepers, and farmers. So what can you personally do to save the bees? What if I told you that in addition to honeybees, there are another 4,000 native bee species living in the US? And you can make simple lifestyle changes to help them. Before I get into all that though, let's take a moment to talk about native bees because they don't get as much attention as honeybees. Our native bees do not live in hives. About 70% of them live underground. Others nest in naturally occurring nooks and crannies or make tunnels of their own. While the social honey bumblebee lives in nests with hundreds of other bees, most native bees are solitary meaning that each female builds her nest without any help. Because native bees do not live in hives, it's much harder to collect data on how they're doing. Citizen scientists are now able to help by keep, to keep track of native bees by recording sightings on taxonomy apps, giving us more data than ever before. Despite this, about a quarter of our known bee species haven't been spotted since the 90s. That's why native bees are important but let me tell you why they're important to me. Back in the spring of 2013, my family needed some help pollinating some backyard apricot trees, but it was still too chilly for honeybees to emerge. We did some research and learned that the native mason bee could work in cooler temperatures. So we built a house for them by drilling holes into a block of wood and hung it outside. Three days later, we already had several tenants. Mason bees are quite, do quite docile, so I was able to watch them up close without fear of getting stung, and it was fascinating. Inside each tunnel, a mason bee uses mud to build several nesting cells, and inside each of these cells is an egg and pollen for the future larva to eat. 
She'll build about two cells a day until the tunnel is full. Then she'll move on to the next tunnel, repeating the same process until she's laid about 10, 15 to 20 eggs. Though I couldn't see what was going on inside, I loved watching the bees meticulously seal each tunnel with a protective layer of mud, acting like masons. After school, i check on our mason bee house to see how many more had been filled, and I was surprised when they had all been filled within a week. A few days after an egg is laid, the larva hatches and spends about 10 days feasting on the pollen and nectar inside its nesting cell. It then spins a cocoon and pupates, growing into an adult by the end of the summer. It'll stay in the cocoon throughout the fall and winter and emerge in the early spring. Male mason bees, which are located on the outside of the nesting cells, emerge first. Female bees, located deeper within the cells, emerge a few days later, better protected from predators. Then the bees mate, and within three to four days, it's time to nest again. I've gotten to observe this cycle throughout my childhood and into adulthood, and each spring is just as exciting as the last. Watching the bees slowly dig their way out of their nests and clumsily take their first flights is magical, especially knowing I had a part in it. If you had asked me before this experience to tell you three facts about bees, I would have confidently told you that they're black and yellow, that they sting and they make honey. Mason bees challenged everything I knew. There are about 140 mason bee species native to the U.S., and many of them are metallic blue, black, or green in color. Chances are you've mistaken them for flies. Mason bees do not produce honey, but they are incredible pollinators. In her six-week lifetime, a mason bee can pollinate up to 2,000 flowers a day. And like I said before, mason bees are quite docile. In the nine years that I've been raising them, I've never been stung. And that's saying something, because I probably deserve it at this point. I bet you're at least a little curious about how to raise mason bees of your own. Mason bees nest in tunnels abandoned by wood-boring insects or in the hollow stems of certain plants. You can build a mason bee house by providing them with ample tunnels of the ideal size. There are endless ways to go about this, but I'm just going to talk about two. The first option is a good craft to make with kids. Grab an unwanted mug, either purchase paper straws of a pencil size diameter, or make your own by rolling magazine pages. These will serve as nesting tubes. Cut the nesting tubes to be slightly shorter than your mug, and then pack them in as tightly as you can until you think you can't possibly fit anymore. Turn it over and give it a good shake. If none fall out, you're in good shape. The second option is a little more classy. You'll need a solid wooden post. Western red cedar is a good choice because it's naturally resistant to rot and fungus growth as well as termites. Drill six inch deep tunnels between five sixteenths and seven eighths of an inch in diameter. Then use scrap wood to make a roof. And finally, tuck nesting tubes inside each tunnel. Once you've built your masonry house, you're going to find a place to install it. You want to make sure it's somewhere that gets lots of morning sun so the bees can warm to flying temperatures. Securely mount it to something sturdy, like a post, fence, or tree, about one to six feet off the ground. You don't want to put it cl too close to a birdhouse, or your bees will just become bird snacks. Mason bees likely already live in your backyard and will find the house on their own. This can take as little as a few days, but don't be discouraged if it takes a while. Some of my mason bee houses fill up entirely within a week, while others don't have any takers the first season. If this happens to you, consider relocating your mason bee house. You can even install several and see which do best. If you're serious about growing your mason bee population, you'll want to take some extra steps to protect them from parasites and predators. In the late summer or early fall, you'll gently remove the cocoons, clean them, and store them in a safe place until springtime. If you take good care of your bees, you can expect them to return year after year. Here are five simple steps you can take to make your backyard more mason bee friendly. Number one, mow less often. Early blooming clovers, dandelions, 
and wild violets are some of the first flowers for bees to forage in the springtime. When you mow them down, the bees have to work harder to find food. I get that we Americans love our well-manicured lawns, but if you can, delay your first mow this season until other flowers are blooming. If you're worried about what the neighbors will think, you can get a yard sign that explains what you're doing. It might even encourage others to join you. Another option is to plant a bee-friendly lawn. Researchers at the University of Minnesota have developed a bee lawn mix that consists of slow-growing grass and flowers that bloom at three inches or less. You can toss the seed mix over your pre-existing lawn or start from scratch. Two, plant native flowers. While ornamental flowers look pretty, their complex petal arrangements can make pollen difficult for bees to access. Native flowers with simple petal arrangements are the way to go. For mason bees, you want to plant flowers that are early blooming in the early springtime. And if you want to be an overachiever, flowers on the blue and yellow end of the color spectrum tend to be most attractive to bees. Number three, leave some ground exposed. Landscape fabric and mulch can be barriers to mason bees trying to find the mud they need to build their nest. So you want to make sure you leave at least some of the ground near their house exposed. This will also help bumblebees and other ground nesting bees. Four, provide a water source. Water is just as important to bees as it is to any other animal. Fill a shallow dish with water, then add pebbles for the bees to land on since the bees can't fly when they're wet. You want to avoid spraying chemicals around your DIY watering hole or any other source of water in your backyard like fountains, sprinkler heads, or bird baths. You don't want to poison your bees. And finally, limit your use of pesticides. A study published by the Royal Society shows that pesticides can have long-term negative effects on mason bees. Bees that had consumed a common pesticide produced 30% fewer offspring than those that had grown up without it. And their offspring produced 20% fewer offspring. Before you spray your garden with pesticides, look into alternatives. There are often safer ways to eradicate the pests you're up against. So let's recap. There are a number of issues that honeybees face, and scientists and beekeepers are working hard to address them. There are another 4,000 native bee species that are also important, and you can help them by making simple lifestyle changes. Mason bees represent 140 of these species. They're docile, incredible pollinators, and low maintenance. To make your backyard more mason bee friendly, you can build a mason bee house, plant native flowers, make a bee watering hole, leave some ground exposed, limit your use of pesticides, and mow less often. All of this is quite doable. Imagine the impact we could have if our neighbors joined us. I used to be a kid who ran from bees, and now I stand on a stage urging you to protect them. All it took was a block of wood with some holes in it. This spring, build a mason bee house. Saving the bees starts with one small action. <laughs>